Welcome to another chapter of Ancient History on Alexandria. In Chapter 11, Wives, we delve into one of the most controversial and debated moments of Romulus's leadership, the securing of wives for his burgeoning city's inhabitants through the event known as the Rape of the Sabines. While the event's name suggests violence, historical accounts paint a picture of a more calculated and strategic move by Romulus. He orchestrated a grand festival, inviting neighbors to join in the celebrations, only for the Romans to claim the unmarried women amongst them. Despite the dramatic beginnings, these women were accorded great respect and became the wives of Roman citizens, integrating into society and setting a precedent that would echo in traditions to come. Join us as we unpack this complex narrative, shedding light on the actions and decisions that shaped the social fabric of early Rome. Remember to subscribe to Alexandria. For more stories from the past, hit the like button if you find our content enlightening, and share this video with those who also appreciate the depths of history. Now, let's explore the legendary tale of wives in the saga of Rome. Chapter 11. Wives, B.C. 751. Every reader who has started studying ancient history must know, in general, how Romulus found wives for the people of his city. This is commonly known as the Rape of the Sabines in history. The actual event may have been very rude, violent, and cruel. If this was the case, the historians who described it tried to make it seem less harsh and remove some of the unpleasant aspects that one might expect from such a situation. According to the account they provide, the entire process was carried out in a way that showed both Romulus and his government's cleverness and wisdom, as well as their fairness and compassion. Here are the details as the historians tell them. As one might expect, the population of Rome was initially made up mostly of men. The laws and regulations mentioned in the previous chapter, regarding the family structure, were created after the community had developed further. In the beginning, there were very few families because the group that first came together to build the city was just a young men's army. It is true that when they started, some middle-aged men and families joined them. However, like in any newly settled cities or countries, the population mostly consisted of men. It was important for men to have wives for several reasons. Firstly, it was necessary for the well-being and happiness of the people. A community consisting only of men is lonely and bleak. Secondly, for the survival and future of the society, it was necessary to have wives and children. This ensures that there will be a new generation to replace the previous one when they pass away. And thirdly, to maintain order and law. Unmarried men, in general, are known to be unruly. There is nothing as effective as having a wife and children at home to keep a citizen away from scenes of chaos and riot. The intense violence of the riots and uprisings that frequently occur in the city of Paris can be partly explained by the fact that such a large proportion of the population is unmarried. They don't have homes, and they don't have vulnerable wives and children to worry about, so they are not afraid of anything. In times of public excitement, they surrender themselves to their most intense emotions. Romulus seemed to understand this, and his first priority was to ensure that as many of his people as possible got married. The first thing he did was send ambassadors to nearby states to ask for alliances and agreements, allowing marriages between his people and theirs. The proposal seemed fair and was presented in a humble and respectful way. In the message, Romulus acknowledged that his colony was still small and not as influential or powerful as the kingdoms it sought alliance with. However, he reminded the recipients that significant outcomes can arise from humble beginnings. He emphasized that their enterprise, although in its early stages, had been greatly successful and was clearly favored by the gods. He expressed hope that in the near future, the new state would be able to reciprocate the favors it currently received. The kings who received these messages laughed at the proposals. They didn't even give proper answers, thinking of the new city as a temporary camp for adventurers and outlaws, which they believed would be short-lived and disorganized. 
They wanted to see it break apart just as abruptly and chaotically as it had been created. They informed Romulus that he should use the same strategy to find women for his city as he had used to recruit men. He should establish a safe place for them. Then, they claimed, the undesirable and morally corrupt people would come to him from all over, and wayward women would be suitable wives for wayward men. Of course, the young men in the city were very angry when they received this response. They wanted war. They wanted Romulus to lead them against these cities right away. They wanted to seek revenge for the insults they had received and forcibly take wives since they couldn't get them by asking. But Romulus calmed them down and told them not to act impulsively. He promised to come up with a better plan to achieve their goal. The plan he came up with was to invite people from nearby states and cities, both men and women, to come to Rome. The goal was to find a good opportunity to capture the women and make the men leave. The main challenge was convincing people to come, especially young women. The shyness of the girls, combined with the disdainful attitudes of their fathers and brothers towards anything related to the new city, would naturally prevent them from coming, unless something very appealing could be created. Romulus waited for a while, to give enough time for any excitement caused by his embassy to settle down. Then, he claimed to have made a significant discovery in a field near his town. This discovery was an ancient underground altar dedicated to Neptune. The workers who were digging at the location uncovered the altar. Nobody knew why it was underground or who built it. The news of this discovery quickly spread everywhere. Romulus thought it was very important. The altar was definitely constructed by the people who lived in the area long ago, and discovering it was a very important event. It was appropriate to mark the occasion with appropriate religious ceremonies. Therefore, plans were made for a big celebration. Along with the religious rituals, Romulus suggested having a large fair on a nearby plain during the same period. Booths were set up, and merchants from nearby cities were invited to bring their goods for sale. People who wanted to buy could come with their money. In short, plans were made for a big and impressive festival. There were also going to be games, races, wrestlings, and other athletic sports, like the ones popular at that time. The celebration would last for several days, with the games and sports happening at the end. Romulus sent messengers to the surrounding areas to announce the schedule of these events and invite everyone to come. He cleverly organized the details so that the main attractions for serious and mature individuals would be on the earlier days, while the later days would be filled with lighter amusements that would appeal to the young, the carefree, and the joyful. It was among this last group that he naturally expected to find the young women whom his men would choose as potential wives. When the time came, the show began. Many people came at first, mostly men, as Romulus expected. They came in groups as if to support and protect each other, and they showed some level of suspicion, vigilance, and mistrust. However, they were warmly and kindly welcomed. They explored the town and were amazed to discover its size. The streets, houses, walls, and temples, though simple in design, exceeded their expectations. The visitors were warmly welcomed and generously entertained. The Romans showed particular care and respect to the women and children who came during these initial days. As the celebrations continued, the company underwent a noticeable transformation. The men stopped being suspicious and vigilant. Some went home and shared stories about the new city, its kind and hospitable inhabitants, and their gentle behavior. As a result, more and more visitors arrived each day to see it for themselves. Gradually, the number of stern and suspicious men decreased, while the number of cheerful and joyful young people increased. In the meantime, the men of the city were given strict instructions by Romulus to treat their guests with utmost respect. The guests were allowed complete freedom to come and go as they pleased unless they were detained by the kindness, attention, and the various new sports and amusements organized for them each day. This went on for two or three weeks, during which the new city became a popular destination for people from the surrounding areas. 
Of course, many young men from the city would naturally form pleasant acquaintances with the visitors. They would come together due to accidental circumstances or personal choice. Without any instructions from Romulus, each man would naturally choose a maiden in advance, whom he intended to make his own when the general seizure took place. The maiden herself would probably be less frightened and resist less when being captured, as she would be familiar with the man attempting to seize her. Romulus planned everything skillfully. The scheme was set to be executed on the last day of the celebration. The most impressive spectacle was scheduled for that day. The Romans were instructed to attend the show armed, but to hide their weapons under their clothes. They had to wait for Romulus to give a sign. Romulus would sit on a special seat where everyone could see him, overseeing the gathering. When the time was right, he would take off a specific piece of clothing, like a cloak or mantle, fold it up, and then unfold it again to signal the start of the event. This mantle was like a royal badge and was brightly decorated with purple stripes on a white background. It was well suited for use as a signal because any movements made with it could be easily seen. With everything set up, the assembly was gathered and the games and spectacles began. The Romans were filled with excitement and nervousness, each person positioning themselves as close as possible to the maiden they planned to capture. They discreetly kept an eye on her, while also watching the royal mantle and the movements of the person wearing it, waiting for the signal to be given. During the event, the men were relaxed and unaware of the imminent danger. The wives, mothers, and children were also safe and unaware of any threat, as Romulus had made it clear that married women should not be harmed. The men had spent several days socializing with the guests and knew which women were unmarried, but they were not allowed to separate any wives from their husbands. Finally, the time came to give the signal. Romulus took off his cloak, folded it, and then unfolded it again. The Romans quickly drew their swords and rushed forward, each trying to secure their own reward. It was a scene of intense excitement and chaos. The entire group of visitors could tell that something deceitful was happening, but they had no idea what exactly was going on. They were mostly without weapons and completely unprepared for such a sudden attack. In a state of panic, they scattered in different directions, trying their best to protect themselves, their wives, and children as they retreated. Their main goal was to save as many people as possible from the chaotic and violent situation. The Romans made sure not to harm them. Instead, they allowed them to leave and ensured the safety of the mothers and children. In fact, their goal was to attack the company and not only take the women, but also scare away all the other visitors. So, in the chaos and fear of the moment, the men scattered in different directions, taking with them the women who were left behind by the Romans. Meanwhile, the Romans themselves retreated with the captured women and kept them safe inside the city walls. When we read this amazing story, we naturally want to know what the damsels did when they were grabbed and taken away by these bold and strong attackers. Did they fight back and try to escape, or did they surrender without much resistance? It is clear that they could not resist effectively, as the Roman young men managed to take them away and keep them. They might have tried to resist, but their strength was overwhelmed by the aggressive and reckless behavior of their captors. However, it cannot be denied that women have the ability to strongly oppose any attempt of abduction by a single man using various methods when they are truly determined. In this case, we don't have any direct information, so we can't form an opinion about how this rough and lawless way of wooing was seen by the people involved. We can only infer from the events that happened later. One event occurred while the Romans were taking and carrying away their rewards. This event later became the basis of a tradition that continued for many centuries as part of the marriage ceremony in Rome. It appears that some young men, who were very young and from a humble background, captured a particularly beautiful girl. This girl was also well-known and respected among her fellow countrywomen. They were taking her away along with the others. 
Some other young Romans from noble families saw this and believed that such a beautiful girl should not be taken by common people. They quickly went after her to save her. The common people quickly rushed away from them, shouting, Thalassio! Thalassio! Which means, for Thalassius! For Thalassius! By saying this, they wanted to express that the prize they had was not meant for any of them, but for Thalassius. Now Thalassius was a young noble widely known and highly respected by all his fellow citizens. When the rescuing party thought that the beautiful lady was meant for him, they agreed and stopped trying to recapture her. With the help of their plan, the common people successfully took their prize to safety. When this situation became known later on, the cleverness of the young commoners and the success of their maneuver received widespread praise. The exclamation Thalassio became a proverb and was later used as an expression of agreement and congratulations by the onlookers at a wedding ceremony. Romulus had given clear and strong orders that the young captives should be treated with kindness and respect after they were captured. They should not be subjected to any violence or mistreatment except for what was necessary to take them to the designated secure locations they definitely experienced some distress and fear. However, they realized that their captors treated them with respect and left them alone, so they gradually became calm and composed during the night. In the morning, they were completely composed and calm. Their fathers and brothers had returned to their own cities, taking the women and children they had saved with them. They were filled with anger and outrage towards those who had betrayed them, they were unsure and anxious about what would happen to the captives and quickly started coming up with and talking about different ideas to rescue and find them. Thus, the night was filled with agitation and excitement, both inside and outside the city. There was a mix of fear and distress among the captives, while their fellow countrymen felt increasing resentment and anger with each passing hour. When morning arrived, Romulus gathered all the captive maidens before him to apologize for the violence they had experienced and explain the reasons why the Romans had resorted to it. You shouldn't, he said, see it as a disrespectful act that they captured you. The Romans didn't intend to dishonor or harm you. They only wanted to marry you honorably. Instead of being upset about the unusual measures they took to capture you, you should feel proud. It shows the passion and devotion your admirers have for you. I will make sure that once you become their wives, you will be treated with the same respect and care that you have been used to receiving at your father's homes. The brief coercion that we used to ensure your safety initially, which we had to resort to out of necessity, is the only roughness you will ever encounter. Forgive us for this liberty we have taken. We want you to know that any fault in it is not ours, but that of your fathers and brothers. They rejected our offers for peaceful alliances, which forced us to resort to this stratagem or lose you completely. If you choose to unite with us, your destiny will be great and glorious. We did not capture you to make you prisoners or slaves, or to lower your status in any way from your previous position, but to elevate you to important positions in a new and growing colony, a colony that is surely going to become great and powerful and of which we intend for you to be the main pride and attraction. The young and attractive Romans watched as Romulus gave this speech, their faces filled with excitement and happiness. The young women also appeared willing to accept their fate. Their anger slowly faded. Throughout history, it has been typical for women to easily forgive and make excuses for any wrongdoing by someone who loves them. These offended young women gradually began to realize that, considering all the circumstances, their kidnappers were not entirely to blame. In a short period, they all quickly understood each other and got married. It is said that there were around five or six hundred of them, and most of them were from the Sabine nation, a group of people who lived north of the Roman colony. The capital city of the Sabines was called Cures, which was approximately 20 miles away from Rome. The Sabines were unsure about what to do in the situation they were facing. 
They wanted to take revenge on their enemies, but they were worried about the safety of their daughters who were held captive. They didn't want to do anything that would make the captors angry and put the captives in danger. On the other hand, their own land was very vulnerable, and they were not sure what would happen if they went to war with the Romans. Their population was divided, living in different cities and towns that were not well fortified, making them easy targets if the Romans were to invade their country. Considering everything, the Sabines decided it would be better to try peaceful methods first before starting a war. They sent an embassy to Romulus to strongly protest against the Romans' treacherous violence and demand the return of the young women. They offered to make peace and form an alliance if the women were returned. They emphasized that they could not accept their daughters being taken away by treachery and force. Although the proposition seemed reasonable, Romulus did not agree to it. It was already too late to change what had happened. Romulus responded by saying that the women, who were now married to the Romans, could not be given back. He explained that the violence that the Sabines complained about was inevitable. There was no other option for them to achieve their goal. He was willing to make a peace treaty and form an alliance with the Sabines, but they had to accept the marriages as valid. The marriages had already been completed, so they couldn't be canceled now. The Sabines on their side could not agree to these proposals. However, they were still hesitant to start fighting, so they kept negotiating. But it seemed like they expected a bad outcome because they were busy getting their troops ready, strengthening their villages and towns, and making other strong preparations for war. The Romans, meanwhile, found the young wives they had obtained through these actions to be a valuable addition to their colony. It was also evident that they not only valued the acquisition, but they were so proud of the cleverness and success of the plan that a symbolic act of force during the bride's capture became a tradition in all future weddings. Always, in the future, when a newly married wife was brought home to her husband's house, it was customary for him to pick her up and carry her over the threshold as if forcefully. This ceremony was a way to remember the forced marriages of his ancestors, who were the founders of Rome. As we close chapter 11, Wives, we've seen how Romulus's quest to secure the future of Rome led to the dramatic and enduring event known as the Rape of the Sabines. This pivotal act, steeped in strategy and controversy, would forever mark the early chapters of Roman history and influence cultural traditions for generations to come. If you're intrigued by the complexities of Rome's founding and the subsequent fallout from Romulus's actions, join us for the next chapter, The Sabine War. There, we will witness the repercussions of Romulus's schemes and the fierce conflict that ensues. To continue this historical journey, simply click on the next video or visit the link in the description below. If you've enjoyed this tale, please subscribe to Alexandria for more glimpses into the storied past, like this video to support our channel, and share it with those who revel in the drama of history. We thank you for joining us through this narrative, and we look forward to unveiling The Sabine War, where the narrative of Rome's early days continues to unfold. Until then, may the echoes of history enrich your understanding of the present.